Hey up and welcome to the Strategy Sessions. My name's Andy Jarvis and this is episode 11. Today my guest is Brittany Muller. Brittany, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Um, hey, look, we're smiling, we're laughing. I've cocked up the beginning to this podcast several times already. So um, I'm just going to let Brittany introduce herself. Brittany, you work for Hugging Face, which is possibly the company with the greatest name we've had on the podcast so far. So tell, tell everyone who doesn't know, who are you, uh, what is Hugging Face, and where does that great name come from? Yeah, that's a great question. And just quick side note, this isn't what my voice usually sounds like. I'm battling a bit of a cold, so bear with me. But You've um, been doing karaoke for the last few nights, haven't you? That's <laughs> yeah, all it is, really. I've been practicing now that, you know, the pandemic's finally letting up and getting ready. Um, yeah, so Hugging Face is incredible. I, previous to working there, I had been a huge fan of their different libraries and the things that they provide. So essentially, if you know anything about OpenAI, which was created by Elon Musk, and it was this mission to make AI and machine learning models open and readily available to the public, that was very quickly closed and monetized, unfortunately. Hugging Face is sort of a bit of the opposite of that in terms of it's really on a mission to democratize machine learning and continue to keep some of these large state-of-the-art models open source and available to the community. And that's really what it's revolving around anyways, is this unbelievable community of machine learning engineers and hobbyists that really dedicate their time and energy and resources to building data sets and models and incredible things. And then the way that we are able to um, continue that effort is also through some of our paid solutions. So we currently offer things like access to some of our experts in the field through an expert acceleration program. That's really incredible and huge companies everywhere are using it uh, to accelerate their machine learning roadmap. Um, and then we also have things like inference API to speed up the actual compression and optimization of these large models. Um, and then we serve private model hub and that's essentially, we're, we're essentially on a mission to become the GitHub of machine learning. And through doing that, we're offering things like private versions of that as well. So that's kind of hugging face in a nutshell. The way the name came about, this is so funny. So I recently, was in New York meeting some team members and I had a chance to talk to all three founders at once at a bar and we were all having fun and hanging out and I finally got to ask the three of them like you know could you share your story of why you called it Hugging Face and my impression was always that it was a play off of these large machine learning models there was a phase of Parsi McParse face and um, Bodie McBoatface, like all these engineers thought it was just funny to name these models ridiculous things that we would have to say out loud. Um, and it's not that case at all for Hugging Face. It was this situation where they, Clement was saying that, you know, he had this idea and was brainstorming it for a while. And he was so confident that this would, this company would go public that he was already thinking of the stock symbol. And he thought, what a cool kind of moment in history to have the first emoji as a ticker symbol instead of an actual like three or four, you know, lettered symbol. And so that's how Hugging Face came to be. <laughs> Suppose... I, I probably shouldn't be surprised that somebody who's working right at the forefront of machine learning and AI it, is already thinking 18 steps ahead. Yeah. Right? That, that, yeah. that shouldn't be a surprise that someone's got that foresight, but I love that. Think big, right? Aim for the moon. Yeah. That's where we've got to go. Um, exactly. oh, fantastic. Well, look, for the, for the idiots who are listening today, and I include myself in that, right? So um, artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, ML, yeah. What's the difference between those two? Because I, when I read things, I see them used and I feel like they're used interchangeably, but I yeah. might suspect that they're very different things. Can you can you kind of get us all up to, to level zero so we all know what we're talking about from here on in? Yeah. So they are often used interchangeably, but the difference is that 
artificial intelligence is the large umbrella under which machine learning sits. And then within machine learning, you have things like deep learning, reoccurrent neural networks, you have different types of machine learning. But AI as a whole, it's a bit of a controversy, actually, because there's still this old school of thought that, you know, we have yet to reach artificial intelligence. There's the whole principle of the Turing test that hasn't yet been, well, it's arguably not been accomplished yet, stating that we haven't yet reached that level of general artificial intelligence. So yeah, it's an interesting topic. Um, you, you see it used all the time in websites and kind of a buzzword, but in my opinion, it should be used a bit more carefully and we should be leaning more so on the term machine learning. Okay. So there's a previous guest on the podcast, JP Castlin, who uh, wrote a great piece about the language of marketing being so imprecise. Now, now granted, we're yes. kind of outside the, the, the scheme of marketing a little bit here, but he was making the point that when I say marketing strategy and you say marketing strategy, we could mean two very different things compared to he has a legal background. Every term in law has exactly the same meaning and every legal person, every lawyer, every advocate knows exactly what that term means. Marketing's not like that. It's quite varied. And I think you're kind of speaking to the same thing that there's probably a great debate, which might feel a bit neckbeardy about um, it has artificial intelligence been reached yet. Uh, yeah. But it is actually a really important debate, especially when you get idiot marketers who like to throw artificial intelligence into a solution that isn't to make it sound cleverer would that be kind of is that one of the things that you guys look at over over coffee sometimes at hugging fish you're like they've set up artificial intelligence on this website and it's not it's just a prediction algorithm is that the sort of argument that goes around your place i haven't heard that just yet but i did <laughs> just have a very fascinating long conversation with margaret mitchell who started the ethical ai board at google uh, and, you know, brought up, um, I'm going to say her name wrong, Timney Hebrew. I think I'm butchering that. I need mm -hmm. to work on that. But um, so she has all this incredible experience with, you know, recognizing bias in AI. And one of the key takeaways I took from that conversation is we need to get better about the lexicons, about the language we're using. We need to all be on the same page because inclusion and diversity are two totally different things and we use them incorrectly all the time and i think the same you know principle can really be applied to machine learning and marketing and the way that we refer to these different systems we you know we need to do a better job just to improve our level of communication excellent well you, you've touched on it there and it and i want to jump into this question it's uh, this is a very positive podcast i'm not trying to catch you out i promise you um, but there are lots of people worried about the rise of machine learning and, and scared about it. And that there's all sorts of uh, fairly semi well publicized if you're in the right Twitter threads and Reddit threads and things about how when machine learning goes wrong. So with yeah. um, picking black faces up and doing it incorrectly, or I think you'd mentioned in a, in a recent blog post how when you search for um, jobs for men, it pulls yeah. up some sort of like politician and soldier and fairly high ranking things. And when you put women in, it throws out cleaner, nurse, prostitute, prostitute or something. Yeah. 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 So, and, and this is an example of, of kind of, but the, am I right in thinking though that the machine isn't biased? It's the data set it's learning from that is biased. And therefore we need to try and work out how we unpick that. Is that, that the the general discussion that's going on in the industry at the minute. Exactly. So it's important to be aware of, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It really comes down to that training data. But something I've learned just as of recently is all data is biased. And unfortunately, even in recognizing that, we're then applying our own values and belief systems on what we think should you know, take precedent over other things. I think the bottom line of that is ensuring that individuals aren't hurt or marginalized or discriminated against through these systems. And we need to do a better job of, you know, machine learning engineers and anyone that's deploying these models to have a better way to recognize the discrimination. Um, I sat in on a really fascinating talk by 
um, Lynn Sue, who works at Microsoft on different uh, bias, you know, making sure there's ethical AI involved at Microsoft and her examples of recognizing uh, discrimination were just fascinating. So I think we have come a long way in terms of having some benchmarks and ways to go about it. There's tons of room for improvement, obviously, but we, we do have to be careful. Uh, one thing that I also learned recently at Hugging Face is um, Margaret Mitchell's earlier work at Microsoft, she was doing lots of vision AI for helping uh, blind and visually impaired individuals see things through different applications. And she fed a model they were working on an image of a really large, horrific explosion. And the model's output was beautiful, stunning, lovely. Wow, because it had never mm -hmm. seen an image like that before, right? It had seen sunsets, it had seen fireworks, and it had no previous information about, and you think about it, we don't tend to take pictures of horrific things as often mm -hmm. as we do really great things. And so her, her thoughts on that were that was just one click away, you know, if that was connected to a system that could continue to create that chaos, thinking it was beautiful and wonderful, like how terrifying that actually is. And let me tell you, I used to laugh at the question, you know, will AI become dangerous? And just even this last year, the more conversations I have with some of the leading experts in this field, the more fear I have going forward in that this used to be a question where I would get, you know, laughs and funny responses. And now all of these individuals I'm currently talking to that are at the head of this cutting edge technology, they really take pause and then, you know, very, they, they'll explain their fears and their concerns because there is rising concerns that as it gets connected to more and more entities and more and more things that the risk of harm will increase. And that to me gives me a real um, a, a positive outlook on this because I think when new technologies like this come along and, and even things like social media, when it first came along, the, the kind of the champions of these technologies are, are often people at, at the forefront of it who are so passionate about the, the benefits that they're blinded to the, the concerns that other people might have or the things that could go wrong. So when the people who are at the vanguard of this are yeah. really aware of the issues, yeah. that gives me hope that we're going to be able to spin back into it and go, right, okay, let's put the right checks and balances in place. Because I think to go back to your example of the, the, the photograph, my understanding is that da the data sets for this sort of thing to work properly have to be huge. Yeah. So if you, by so the law of big numbers means that when you have a lots of pictures or lots of words about things, you're going to get better results, more accurate results. We don't have as many, the results aren't going to be as great. So things like explosions or edge cases or even small countries. So, yeah. you know, I, I think of yeah. um, so a country like New Zealand, which is 4 million people, punches above its weight globally. Um, but actually, the data set of, say, faces that you can train on of people from a New Zealand heritage is actually tiny because it's only a country of four million. There's probably more people within an hour's drive of where you sit right now than, in, in, than there is in all of New Zealand. So it's a really interesting thing of understanding how do we how do we focus on the small things as well as the big things. So the fact that the people who are behind this are, are worrying about it gives yeah. me hope for the future. I love that perspective so much and yeah, could not agree more. Brilliant. So right, we, we're worried about, we've got the things we're worried about, but what, yeah. are, the, what are the big positives in the takeaways? Because people aren't just going into machine learning and, and, um, and AI because it's fun and there's something to do and there's some investment dollars going around. People are, are in this because there's great things that can be done to improve life and society. So what, what are the, some of the cases where, where uh, machine learning can really help us and improve what, what we do. Yeah, there's so many really exciting spaces. A couple that I get really excited about is in the medical space, the ability to more accurately identify disease and problems early and help save people's lives is already happening today. There are really powerful applications and pharmaceuticals and identifying new drugs that haven't been used for 
different applications that could be really successful. Uh, some other spaces, I know there's a group at the Allen Institute working on um, wildlife protection in terms of they're using machine learning on drones to identify poachers on elephant sanctuaries and in cool. elephant areas in Africa. And how cool is that? Like what? Amazing. Yes. I love that application so much. And then also they're using underwater sonar and machine learning to uh, monitor this endangered, endangered population of whales off the Pacific Northwest coast. And they're able to follow and through the sounds are able to monitor the health and kind of swoop in with different resources to help protect the set of whales. Um, there's di different crazy kind of rumors about, uh, you know, old cell phones being used in weatherproof boxes that are put way up high in the rainforest. And they're using just the microphone on the cell phones to identify illegal deforestation. So anytime like a chainsaw is picked up, it alerts local authorities and they can stop this process of you know illegal chopping down of trees. I mean, there's tons and tons of really cool applications like that. This must be like a really old cell phone, like um, a Nokia <laughs> 3310 or something like that. The ones that you could charge once and the battery would last for a month. Yeah, you couldn't exactly. do it with an old Apple device, could you? I mean, those things last about three hours when they're not plugged into charge. So that's gotta be a that. great gotta be point. Device. Gotta be. Yeah, so, <laughs> right. Well, look, well, one of the things let, we'll go and check. We will go and check yeah. in the rainforest because I, I love. I've never been and I want to go. But moving on, moving on. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck here with me talking about old tech forever. Uh, th this is a, a marketing podcast, and you are the marketing manager for Hugging Face. So what? Yeah. You've got all this amazing technology behind you, and all these great things happening. But what are the what are the key objectives for you as marketing manager there? What things would you wake up in the morning and go, right, I need to smash this out of the park? Yeah. So there's a bit of a dissidence happening, to be totally candid, between the things that, you know, we're a marketing team of two, first of all. So we're quite mm -hmm. limited in the things we're able to do. Um, that being said, it's such a small team at Hugging Face that we can move really quickly. So between the two of us, we're able to execute projects on our own relatively quickly and have a lot of fun in that space. But there's this other side of the company where we really also want to use marketing to leverage our paid solutions. A lot of people aren't even aware that Hugging Face offers these paid solutions. So as a marketer, you know, instead of just focusing on like fun SEO stuff, I sort of have to put on different marketing hats and think, well, shit, how do I do that, <laughs> right, in a way that yep. also cultivates awareness and qualified leads for these paid solutions, and that's a much, much harder thing to accomplish. Um, I would love to, you know, sit at my desk all day and come up with really fun content marketing ideas uh, that use our tools in a way that we create virality through, you know, here's what we learned analyzing the top thousand plus machine learning and engineer job posts, or here's, you know, the Twitter conversations by region mm -hmm. um, taking place on X. Like you can do really cool things with the models we house. I know my marketing lead, Federico, uh, was a co-founder of Monkey Learn. And over there, they would apply natural language processing to their content marketing in a fascinating ways like he applied natural language processing to uh, twitter information about hotel reviews and he isolated it to regions and people in france most often complained about croissants and then um in like I mean, the french do love a croissant right they do love yeah it. <laughs> that was the biggest negative sentiment and then in, i think it was bangladesh it was cockroaches and like, it was very regional specific and fascinating to apply that information in a way that I think, um, you know, people are so interested in, right? We're interested in timely events. We're interested in geo-specific information. And I think marketers as a whole have not taken advantage of that and had as fun with that as they could. Um, I recently pitched an idea at Hugging Face that 
basically immediately told me no. And I did in my spare time where I have this theory that we can learn a lot about Craigslist free listings. And I saw you do this. this. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> so stupid, but I just, it was something I had so much fun doing and I knew people would get a good laugh of, you know, learning about their city and what's the top unique free listed item. And it really does reflect some of the local cultural uh, perceptions that we have. So things like that, I think are so, so much fun. So the last guests I had on the show were uh, two guys from a company called Statsports. They do performance monitoring for professional athletes. So when you see sports, usually soccer players, they whip the shirt off when they score and they're wearing this vest with a performance tracker in the back. So these guys, based in Ireland, they make this tracker and they're, they're working with um, Major League Soccer, a lot of baseball teams, a lot of football teams, Premier League soccer teams. They work with kind of, if you named the 10 biggest sports organizations in the world, they're probably working with eight of them. Um, so they've got a whole their business makes money in the B2B space, right? By signing yeah. these companies up. But they also started selling in the last couple of years to consumers. So you're a, an, av an amateur sports person like myself. You want to track your data and you can compare yourself to the pros as well. How, you know, how yeah. fast do you run? The, so, so, and we talked to them about, look, how do you do this B2C stuff with the B2B bit together? And look, they're in a, a sexy, fun industry, but they yeah didn't really see a difference they were like look this stuff helps drive this stuff and this stuff helps drive this strikes me when you're talking about the the two parts of your role that you, you've got all this fun interest in sort of almost consumery type marketing but the the bit that pays the bills is the the business to business type marketing and it feels like there's maybe a little bit of tension between the two so what are you doing to square the circle are you kind of going yeah. well we'll do a little bit of this or are you keeping them separate what's your thought process I think it's very difficult. I think that's sort of a directional, it needs to take direction from the top. So what is the North Star? What is it that we're trying to accomplish this quarter and this year? And how can our efforts impact that? So for us right now, it, we are focused on monetization. We are focused on figuring out some of our paid solutions. So growing awareness growing SEO has taken a back seat to that. Um, I always have stuff on my desk, you know, just to like keep this stuff in mind. It's like always prioritized by impact. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> but like it's constantly yes. being drilled in my brain. And I think it's important. I think employees across an org, you need that North Star. You need something by which you can prioritize what you're working on on a daily basis and making sure that you're driving that impact. So that's something I think about regularly. I love the sticky note on yeah, the, on your desk. Right? I, I'm a big believer when I work in companies who create the strategy with them. I'm like, what, what do we do with this now? It's like, stick it on the wall yes. next to everybody's desk, everyone's machines. And they <laughs> yeah. can see it, right? Yes. What's the point in hiding the strategy? And you hear this sometimes. Well, what, what if somebody leaves and takes it to a competitor? I'm like, I don't care, right? Yeah. They can have the bit of paper if you like, but they don't have all these great things and people here driving it yeah. forward. So share it, publish it online, let people know where you're going. Yes. We're not quite there yet. Some companies are a bit still like, mm, you don't know about that, Andy. Um, but no, I mean, look, stick it there. Every day you come and you look, prioritized by impact. I love that line. I'm going to pinch it and pretend it was mine. It's so important. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what sort of tactics are you using then when, when you're thinking prioritized by impact? Can you yeah. maybe talk us through like one thing or, or what sort of tactics do you have in mind for the next quarter? Yeah. So it's interesting. So we're still such an early stage startup that I, my opinion is that we really need to get a bunch of experiments under our belt. We really need to figure out what sticks in terms of distribution strategy, content, how are we creating these qualified leads? Who are the key stakeholders that even make the decisions to purchase one of our paid solutions? Um, what does that look like? What are those titles? We've done tons of research with LinkedIn. Um, we're creating content to target those individuals. We're testing out different distribution strategies. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, we need to have a point where we take a step back and we evaluate, okay, throughout this process, what has worked well and what hasn't? How can we kill our darlings and focus on the things that have driven impact? 
Yeah. Uh, kill your darlings is... You have to. Yeah. It, it's great advice for marketing. And we're yeah. going to talk about conference speaking soon as well. And it is great advice for conference speaking as well, isn't it? It's like just yes. kill your darlings, kill your darlings. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. So um, you, mentioned the, you mentioned the S word um, during that as well. You mentioned science. Because uh, one of your previous roles was a senior SEO scientist at Moz. So... Yeah. Uh, I, a company I've got a lot of respect for. I, I know and love a few people who have work or have worked there. Um, so what? You're not just an SEO from from Moz. You're an SEO senior SEO scientist. What? What's the job there? What did you do? What tests were you running? What? What? Talk us to do that. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. They, you got to give Moz props. They give so much autonomy to their employees and trust for you to kind of run wild with what you feel will be interesting research or uh, valuable webinars. And so through the SME team, which was myself, Dr. P and the late Russ Jones, which is, I still just mm-hmm. can't believe, um, we had so much fun coming up with you know, this is what the community has been talking about lately. We see these trends with our data. This could be really valuable to put into, you know, some sort of research that we then deliver and are basically a catalyst of that information to the incredible community. And then the cool part about all that is the community really takes it to the next level. So we, you know, like I said, we sort of served as this catalyst of deeper research and information from the data we had access to. And then the unbelievable SEO community continues to bring all of those things and level it up, asking the right questions, applying it in more interesting ways, creating tools. I mean, that's kind of the beauty of the industry as a whole. There's um, a there's a word for it which I can't remember at the minute, but that way that the community builds on things is just fantastic. Kind of, we yeah. all stand on the shoulders of giants, don't we? You yes. know, we? We've done something and then jump on that, and somebody builds on it, and you can. Uh, there's a real collaborative, collegiate spirit most of the time in in the SEO world. Yeah. There is there is sometimes a bun fight between the community and throwing things at each other, but we'll we'll, sure. we'll worry about that another time. Yeah. About that another time. <laughs> um, so you had some great times at Mo- which is. Uh, so we've had Rand on the show, uh, feels like a thousand years ago now, and Rand yes. talks about his exit from there and, and some of the things. So, but as a company, it, it kind of grew, maybe evolved a little bit and changed, but it's still one of the leading SEO tools out there, right? Um, but you loved your time there running yeah. search science tested. I suppose what I'm looking at here is from an SEO side of things, was it just the greatest place to go and learn being there surrounded by well, Dr. Pete, first of all, but everybody working there feels like they're just yeah. an amazing set of people. Honestly, yes. And also the fact that, I mean, again, that aspect of trust and it felt like such a safe place to make mistakes, which I think is so essential in innovation in and of itself is having that safety net of, you know, go break things, go learn. Um, And so the fact that I was able to test different things on moz.com and had this freedom to experiment and break featured snippets that we had and figure out what would break them and what wouldn't and, you know, kind of reverse engineer the whole SEO process was so incredibly fun and it didn't feel like work, you know, when you're doing things like that, that you're genuinely interested in and I've sort of had the mentality from the start of my SEO career of, you know, this is an industry that you can really have fun with in terms of gamifying it. In my head, it's always, there's always a game going on with different search terms and information and how to hack this or how to improve the markup here and feed it to Google. So they'll add your schema markup or maybe, you know, honor a featured snippet better and all these things. So Yeah, I feel incredibly grateful to Moz and all the employees there that I got the privilege of working with to to learn and just have fun in that space. Brilliant stuff. And there's definitely a lesson there in making mistakes. I mean, the whole point of science really is is not knowing if you know something's going to succeed or you know something's going to work. That's not science that, you know, setting a hypothesis and testing it, which by its very nature, should lead to failure. It, it yes. is what science is about, well, at least in my eyes anyway. So, 
Um, totally if they let me make the description of science, that's what it is. <laughs> um, but you've also worked freelance as well, or, or you've set up yeah. your own consultancies and agencies before. Different world moving from working in a team the size of Moors to working on your own. How did you find that transition? I really loved it. I feel incredibly lucky and grateful to be in a position where I got the privilege of choosing some of the clients I got to work with moving out of Moz. Um, and they, they think I'm lying and I can't say who they are, but I always, there's one particular client. They are my favorite team in the world to work with. They are part of a large company that everyone has heard of and their ability to learn, receive feedback, experiment on different items with me has has been so incredible in the growth that we've seen in our time working together as far as traffic and monetary numbers it is just outrageous i've never been a part of something that large before and it feels really good to apply all of my previous knowledge and experience to something a bit bigger and through a consulting framework it you know it's it's been a nice step back for me um, to not you know be full-time SEO in-house and just kind of have that experience as well. There is something quite lovely about being able to pick and choose the people you work with, isn't there? Yeah, um, it's everything, everything. Yeah, I, mean, I, I have a, the, the All Blacks rugby team have this part of their policy called no dickheads. Um, so <laughs> yeah. it, it basically means, every, you know, a Jim Collins maybe uses a more appropriate, like you've got to have the right people on the bus, that, that sort of approach. <laughs> But, you know, I, I have a, a, a bullshit detector that when I yes. go, go for sales meetings with people who want to work with me, I'm like, eh, this isn't feeling right. <laughs> you know, yep. just yep. walk away. You can yeah. feel it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you learn so it funny. early. So that was your second, I, I don't want to maybe want to call it freelancing. You set up a, a consultancy, but that was the second time you'd done that before you went to Moz, you, you worked or you set up a, a, an agency as well. Correct. Is the... Do you feel like you've always got that entrepreneurial itch you need to scratch? Is that, um, you know, do you always feel like it was something that keeps coming around as you get older and older and older? Totally. It's always there. Um, I learned so much starting that agency. I mean, I was so young when I started it. And, you know, at the peak, I had seven full-time employees and we were doing very well in the medical space. But I, to this day, like I have a lot of guilt around how I operated it. Like I just, you know, I wish I would have been a better manager. I wish I would have been a better leader. There are so many things I would go back and change, but ultimately, you know, through my experience moving forward, I realize where my strengths are now more than ever. And I don't necessarily love managing people. It's not a strong suit of mine. I'm better suited in a role that, you know, can get in the weeds and get a little scrappy and provide things here and there. Um, so I think learning, you know, what you love to do and what you don't necessarily love to do is just as important as anything in the growth of your career. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love yeah. the, the phrase I use is a building phrase, but I like being on the tools. I, yeah. you know, I, I love being in working yeah. with clients, digging, finding the problem, working out how we're going to fix yeah. it. I love that. And, and there's two of us at Eximo and I, I, I'm in a sort of a growth phase at the moment, but it's something I'm really, really aware of that some people love it. And just like, I, the sooner I can stop doing this and work and then I can run the company, the better. I'm like, no, the sooner I can get big enough to bring somebody in to run the company so I can just go back yes. to doing the thing I love. That, yes. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Exactly. Really happy. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and one thing, I suppose you, you mentioned how young you were when you started that. And th there's two people I, I've met ever who look the same age when I first met them and when I met them five years <laughs> afterwards, right? And there's you and Ross Simmons. Like Ross Simmons has a portrait of himself in his attic, right? That man has looked the same age for 30 years. He doesn't age. He's about 195 and he never changes. It's no wonder he's so good at marketing. He's been doing it since before marketing was invented. But yeah, Ross is like, he does not change, does he? You're like, no, he does not. He no, does not. So, but you, you've That's been drinking so nice. from the same cup of oh, eternal life or whatever you. as he has. 
Um, anyway, right, enough of that. So the, the reason I know that you haven't changed in a number of years is we met a number of years ago in Dublin. You were keynoting yeah. at Learn Inbound. And you are, this is turning into some awful psychophantic kind of fanboy thing, but you are one of my top three or four um, conference speakers of all time, right? I love watching you speak. It's just, Thank it's you. interesting. It's a show. It's educational. And it's one of the things, I mean, I always think when I speak at conferences, you've got to entertain people as well as educate them because yeah. you can yeah. educate people all you like. If you bore them to tears, nobody's listening anymore. <laughs> so true. And you put on a show, right? Yeah. And uh, Stacey yeah. McNaught is another one. She puts on a show. I absolutely love that. Will Reynolds. Yeah. I mean, Will could read me the phone book and I would, yeah. I would sit and be like, <laughs> keep talking. Well, I love it. Right. And, and you're in that, you, you, you're up there with me. So, um, Thank conference you. speaking you enjoy it don't you you get a kick from it I do I enjoy the people mm -hmm. I enjoy connecting and again sort of serving as a catalyst to provide different and new information to individuals to help them then level up the industry and level up the work that they're doing yeah now, um, you you also share advice with people as well about uh, dealing with nerves and imposter syndrome yes. and things like that. For because there are a lot of people who maybe want to do conference speaking or even want to come on as a guest on a podcast. The number of people yeah. I ask to come on says, "Will you be a guest?" And they're like, "I don't know if I'd have anything to say." I'm like, no, I've yeah. seen you writing. I've seen what your what your work does. Come on and talk about it. And like, no, nah, no, nobody'd yeah. be interested. What sort of advice do you give yeah. to people about that? Because I'm like. I think that's a very normal thought process. I think we're all human and we all have this fallacy of, you know, we have no idea what we're doing and we aren't as experienced as we think we are. Um, and I think it's just important to realize that we're all on the same page with that. You know, no one really knows what they're doing. There's, there's just a level of getting more comfortable in the speaking space to talk about the things that you're comfortable and confident talking about and have experience in. And quite frankly, everyone has things to talk about. Everyone has mm -hmm. unique marketing stories and case studies and experiences that would be valuable to be shared amongst others. So I think to give yourself a little bit more credit and to just go practice. There's, I believe Toastmasters are all around the world. They're uh, a, yep. such a great and easy free way to dip your toes in. Um, and I also say this as someone who was initially so terrified of public speaking that I would, this is so embarrassing, Andy. I would literally be walking to Toastmasters when I was living in Denver, Colorado, and I would get to the building and I would just keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. No. I'd be like, I would be sweating. I'd be like, no, not today. Like, <laughs> but like, it gets easier. It gets better. Like you just have to, that's the hardest part is just, getting started and once you realize oh this is a fight or flight response that's not necessary these people aren't lions that are kind of come eat me it's going to be okay you know yeah i yeah. i'm in a i'm in the speakers group for brighton seo i'm, I'm keynoting uh first day this, this year so oh it's amazing I, I oh, uh, listen i'm sorry I, did, did i mention that keynote in brighton seo yes, today. um I, and i'm i'm really excited and also absolutely terrified right yeah and I come across as quite a confident, in fact, I am a confident speaker when it comes to being on stage. I, I make sure I know my material and I get it across well. And yeah. look, there's other people in the speakers group who've maybe not done things, but have maybe seen me speak before as well, but maybe this is their first gig. And they're like, so I'm talking in this group about being nervous and being petrified. And some people are like, you're not nervous, are you? I'm like, absolutely terrified. Before yeah. I go on stage, my hands are going, my palms yeah. are sweaty. I can feel the... Um, uh, you know, I always get the uh, M&M, you know, there's vomit on his sweater already, mum's spaghetti. I'm like, his palms are nervous. I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah. my heart's going. But once you've done it once and you realize that you didn't die when you were on stage doing that thing, yes. you start to realize, that, oh, hold on, I didn't die that time. So I'm not going to die this time. And actually, that's just my body's way of making sure I know my shit before I go on stage. Yes. So. I get that. I start to feel that, like we're a month out and I can already start to think I need to go back to my slides. And those nerves are just my body's way of telling me, go back to your slides, 
Make sure you know them. Make sure you know your material. Make sure you know what you're doing. You got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. And once yeah. I know that, I can have that rational conversation with myself stage side where my body, yeah. where my the little one in my right ear starts to go, Andy, you need to run, run away, run away quick. Yeah. The guy on my left shoulder's like going, no, no, you know this. You got this. You, you know you got yeah. this. You did it yesterday. You did it the day before. You practiced in the bathrooms earlier. Yeah. You were talking to yourself on the way here. You got this. And then you're like, okay. But realizing you're not going to die on stage is probably yes. step number one, isn't it? And after that, sorry, I'm rumbling about this now. But no, that, it's so good. Great. Yeah. That's a, that's such a common experience. And I think the coolest part about what you just said is that whole notion of you feel those nerves so far in advance and then leading up it, they get stronger and stronger. That physiological experience is identical to arousal or excitement. It's been proven. So what I was told by a speaking coach when I started at Moz was you need to just tell yourself every time you think oh, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm excited. I am excited. Like just kind of like slap your thoughts and say, nope, yeah. that's excitement. I am just really excited to share this information. It's going to be great. And so you have to kind of, you know, talk yourself down and also to kind of get out of that headspace where once you get carried away with your thoughts, you're not as in tuned or in your body or you're, you're less grounded, which takes away from your speaking. And so something I work really hard on is kind of grounding myself before a talk. I'll wiggle all my toes in my shoes and I mentally think 10 toes down and I like try to feel every toe and it just kind of grounds you. Um, You've only so got like 10 toes. <laughs> Can you believe it? Yeah, weird. I thought everyone had 12 super, like me, right? That's, that's super weird. That's I know, oh. you're special. Oh. <laughs> and so let, let's go back to something you said earlier as well just before we wrap up about kill your darlings and yeah now you're presenting now about machine learning and fairly technical heavy duty stuff and what you do really well from what i've seen is you you make it accessible but you also keep the story to what you're doing you can kind of you bring people on a journey any yeah. idiot can present technical data and bore you to death not everyone yeah. can present technical information and, and bring it to life so how do you tackle the kill your darlings? Because I know I struggle with this. I have great jokes in mind. I'm like, this is the funniest joke ever. And yeah. I just know it has to come out. I'm like, it just doesn't work here. But how yeah. do you face that fact? Um, so everything in terms of speaking revolves around the audience. So they come first before anything. I put my ego aside, my you know humble brags in my talk i will kill those so fast if i don't think it's serving the larger purpose of these people came and they're providing two of their most valuable resources their time and their attention and i take that incredibly seriously so from the start of framing up a talk i'm constantly thinking about how will this be immediately applicable to the work that they're doing and accessible in a way that helps them and so I try it really hard to kind of craft that story around inspiring them to take that action. And then oftentimes I get a lot of my improvements and uh, feedback from the audience after the talk. Mm -hmm. I love, that's the part I miss the most, Andy, is just like connecting with people. Like when we had a beer, like that was so much fun. I miss that stuff because that's when, you know, I learned more about, what people are working on, what they need, how, you know, how my work can better serve that larger purpose. Brilliant. And look, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sick to death of virtual conferences and I've been doing them. I've been presenting at them, but I'm so sick of them. So being back at Brighton in person is just like, yes. So. yes. Oh, look, awesome. just, just before we wrap up, um, one, one question quickly before I ask you about books and recommendations, you've got a pet snake. Yes. Um, tell us about the snake briefly. Oh, she's the best. Her name's Pumpkin. She's a little cranky right now, which means she's just quiet and hiding in her hide. Um, yeah. But yeah, she's a ball python. She's about four and a half feet. She's very overweight. She's almost six pounds and she should be like two. <laughs> so she's on is a bit of a diet. Is that down to somebody overfeeding her, perhaps? So, she's just uh, so happy, Andy. She's, just, <laughs> she's so happy. <laughs> we're all happy when we're eating, Brittany. We are all happy. <laughs> I know. I know. She's the best. I don't. I honestly don't think I could have gone through the pandemic in 2020 without her. We had so much fun. Uh, yeah, she's one of my best buds. 
Brilliant stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, look, um, before I let you go, two things. Number one, yeah. tell me about um, books, podcasts, newsletters, any resources that you would recommend to people listening to the podcast. Ooh. So I, you know, I've really been working hard to kind of increase my knowledge in statistics, data science, machine learning, um, all of that stuff. And some of the things that I really enjoy are the Data Skeptic podcast where mm-hmm. complex data science and machine learning concepts are described in such simple, digestible ways that just from listening, I mean, it's incredible that even some statistical information like that you can get from listening to a podcast um, has helped me so much in my journey to learn more about the field. Highly recommend that. Um, there's so many great books out there on Python, Pandas, uh, Machine Learning with Python is one of my favorites. My fellow co-workers at Hugging Face just released um, a new book about transformers in NLP, and it's absolutely fantastic. It, it's the one book where reading it, I feel less stupid being like, oh, thank God, like this information wasn't available before, where I was so confused about different things with transformers architecture and they finally describe it in a way where I'm like, I get it. I get why padding is necessary in a model. I finally get it. So like things the light like bulb that, moment. Are, yes, things like that are being provided in better and better ways. There's so many great resources online. I'm personally working on, you know, different, um, accessible material for marketers. I don't know that I'll be able to launch it on Hugging Face, but I think I'll launch it regardless just to help people Mm -hmm. um, get more in tune with pandas. I think there are really fascinating ways, honestly, to get insights from Google Search Console data. And just through this more advanced process, without even realizing it, you will learn about statistics. You will learn about data science. So I'm working on a course that would do that. Uh, So super excited about things like that in which it's applicable in nature, immediately valuable. And people are also like, oh, holy shit. I just learned how to import data into a Colab notebook or a Jupyter notebook and how to clean out that data very quickly and how to do this. So I think that will become more and more available to the marketing and SEO community as a whole, helping to really kind of level up our field because I don't think we have enough statistical knowledge. The amount of data that we work with and the way that we work with it, it's a little frightening that we have gotten this far without a stronger hold on statistics, distribution, different, you know, so I think there's a huge, yeah, there's a huge opportunity for all of us to it's Level a huge bugbear of mine that um, marketers, um, especially content marketers, I'm calling them out, put out, you know, they, they'll do research and then yeah. make these ridiculous claims, extrapolating data that just does not, you cannot extrapolate your survey of 12 people to, or yeah. we did a Twitter poll and we've decided that and you're like, no man, you didn't, you, you, you just didn't, yeah. <laughs> you cannot do this. Um, but there are charlatans, I've worked on a project, I, I'm going to have to tiptoe around all of the names, but a very big agency based in London had used Twitter data and then extrapolated that and said, this is what this country is like. I can't really get any more specific than that. Yeah. And I just remember sitting and reading the presentation going, man, this is shit. Yeah. And then I found out how much they paid for this. And anyway, anyway my, my, it's doesn't matter. the I'm, fuzzy logic needs to die. It's very bad. Very, and absolutely. I'm just as guilty of it. You know, I've done stuff like that in the past. And I think we're, we should all be on a mission to get better. We need to be better. We need yeah. to be better. Yeah. Excellent. And lastly, then, one last question for you. What one question do you usually get asked that I haven't asked you today? Okay. You know what my favorite question is? And this is, I will ask this at parties, at happy hour on podcasts. It's one of my favorite questions. And I think it's such a simple question, but the quickest way to better get to know someone. And the question is, what have you been interested in lately? And it could be anything. It could be a project, a theory, a book, a podcast, a movie, whatever. And to just give people the freedom to really think about what, what in their spare time, what does that look like? I have so much fun asking that question and getting interesting feedback um, from people. 
And the topic I've been so stuck on for like months now, this is a little embarrassing. It's this, it's this principle called entrainment. And it's this insane phenomenon that occurs when objects in motion are near each other. So this was first discovered in a room of great grandfather clocks back in the 1800s. And a man in the room was going to lunch and on his way out, he swung all the pendulums randomly as he walked out the door and he came back like 30 minutes later and they're all in sync, right? No. Yes. And you can, there's YouTube videos that I will watch just fascinated, but I have, now I have all developed all these theories around entrainment in that we now know, you know, women close to each other sync up their cycles. Um, People, when, you know, you're with a loved one, oftentimes your heartbeats will sync up as you talk to each other. And so I think this is just another huge case for be so careful with who you surround yourself with, right? You are the average of the five people closest to you and to choose those people wisely because their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions, their energy get entrained with you. And so it's something I think about way too often, but I have so much fun like looking into it. Brittany, that, that is hands down, hands down, <laughs> damn it, the best answer to that question I have had on this podcast, right? This is incredible oh, shit. I'm going off to start reading. Thank now you. you've ruined my weekend, right? I am going to read about this all weekend. <laughs> I'm also going to watch iRobot, the Will, Will Smith movie, because yeah. there's a bit in there where the robots all converge in the corner of um, uh, where they're being stored. And there's just this bit it's like, why do they do that? It's like, yeah. Oh, now I know the name for Entrainment. it. Entrainment. They even train soldiers not to walk in unison when going over a bridge because it will collapse bridges if they walk together there's like stories of bridges coming down and killing soldiers so they're taught like don't walk in the same pattern isn't that crazy I, it literally it's boom that, i'm gonna get the blow my mind emoji out and bang that's what's <laughs> going on with the email with this episode so brilliant what have, wait what have you been interested in uh, what have i been interested in lately um Could be anything so I, listen, I am, I'm, I'm turning the world's most boring man at the minute for, for various reasons. And um, so I've been interested in storytelling again, because I, I can't have cards on the table. Brighton is my first in-person event that I'll be speaking at for, well, two, like everybody else, two, two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, usually if I was doing something that big, I would probably do, a, um, I would have the presentation tested in a couple of different smaller events first. That's yeah. not happening. So I've gone back to the basics of storytelling, looking at how um, the different types of story that the Greek philosophy, Greeks would say that there's only, I think, four different types of story, tragedy, comedy, love story, and I don't know, what's the other one? I can't remember, but I've, I've been looking at how they build stories and what yeah. the overlaps are and how they all stick together and trying to find those elements and actually then sort of saying, okay, well, how do you build that into a marketing presentation? How do you what are the bits and why do they use those mechanics and how do you use yeah. that across the 30 minute keynote to keep people with you to to bring them along with you because you, you can't i'm trying to get away from talking at people yeah. and i want to bring them into the presentation yeah. but audience participation is difficult and raise your hand if no yeah no so i have elements yeah. where i want to bring people in and kind of sort of breach that wall but i want to do it through storytelling so i'm looking at that and how i stitch it together that's what i've been interested in oh and that's so cool now i feel like i'm a guest on muller cast or whatever they, whatever your <laughs> point is gonna well jeez but look, no, I'm... this I'm is excited. honestly the hands down everyone should be if you listen to the podcast and you're coming on soon you need to aspire to be this good right this is how good you need to be on the podcast. So. Oh, Brittany, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. This has been truly amazing. Thank you very much. And we shall. Oh, sorry. Yeah. How do people get in touch with you if they want to talk to you? Oh, good question. Probably most active on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, can connect with me on LinkedIn, but probably Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. There's a link in the show notes. Uh, so if you want to find Brittany on Twitter, it's there. Click on that and say hi to her. Brittany okay. Muller, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.